This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 87 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History podcast. Today is Thursday, January 25th, 2018. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. On this episode, we give Hiram Smith his long overdue Nemo nickname. We catch up with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as their mission in Europe quickly draws to a close, and they have been busy baptizing and converting thousands of prospects into Mormons who were eager to move stateside to see how green the grass is in Nauvoo. Finally, on April 20th, 1841, the Quorum of Twelve Apostles boarded a ship headed for New York. After the history portion, we bring on Ryan McKnight and Ethan Dodge for a Mormon Leaks Minute. Let's get into it. You heard it in the intro, we are going to catch up with Brigham Young and the rest of the Quorum of the Twelve, but first we have to endow Hiram Smith with his own Nemo nickname. This was a hard one for yours truly. First off, Hiram is such a unique and phonetically unpleasing name already, so the source material was already tough to work with, but we must persevere. And out of a bunch of really good entries for Hiram Smith, who was Joseph's second in command, his sidekick, if you will, we're going to go with a post on the Facebook page by Gazalem Ali, who nominated Sidekick Abiff. Ah, it's just perfect. So Hiram Smith will be known to us until 1844 as Sidekick Abiff. That name will make a lot more sense once we get into 1842. Uh, but, you know, we'll put up our next potential nominee for a Nemo nickname at the end of the history portion today. So stick around and, you know, be sure to play along. For now, let's take that Sidekick Abiff nickname and run with it and shift our focus to Europe. Brigham Young had made himself extremely useful to the church. Joe had established the Traveling Quorum of Twelve Apostles back in 1835, and since then the Quorum had been on various missions to places far from the nuclear center of the church. The Quorum of Twelve Apostles were essentially established as the primary missionary force, with full ruling authority of the church wherever they may be proselyting to at any given time. The Quorum was to act as a satellite committee of Mormon leadership to establish stakes in far-off lands. With the death of David Patton during the 1838 war between the Mormons and the state of Missouri, and with the apostasy of Thomas B. Marsh, Bloody Brigham was essentially the senior most member of the Quorum, making him and his best friend, Hebrew the Creeper Kimball, the leaders of the Traveling Quorum of Apostles. Joe had called the Quorum to a mission to Europe in September of 1839, around the same time that Joe was preparing for his trip to meet with the president, and uh, by the spring of 1840, they had landed on the shores of England to begin their mission. When the mission initially began, there was opposition to their proselyting, and there was really throughout the entirety of their mission, but they eventually began to meet with some success. We'll talk about that and the reported numbers in a little while here, but first we need to try and take stock of why the Mormon proselyting was so appealing and effective to Europeans in the first place. America was only an ocean apart from Europe geographically, but socially it was worlds apart. 
The ruling aristocracy in England, funded by worldwide power granted by the East India Trading Company, had created an economic divide between the working and ruling classes, and only the wealthiest were insulated from being negatively affected by this gap. With the increased implementation of the Industrial Revolution, families who had been farmers or small merchants for generations in small communities were selling their plots of land to large farming corporations and they themselves were moving into major metropolitan areas to work in factories and shops and, you know, small businesses like this at alarming rates. So here's just a really awesome snapshot that was written by somebody named Tom Lambert on localhistories.org. And he writes extensively about 19th century life in England. And we're going to be reading a fair amount from uh, a couple of his posts here. You'll find links to everything in the show notes. From Tom Lambert, quote, During the 19th century, life in Britain was transformed by the Industrial Revolution. At first, it caused many problems. But in the late 19th century, life became more comfortable for ordinary people. Meanwhile, Britain became the world's first urban society. By 1851, more than half the population lived in towns. The population of Britain boomed during the 1800s. In 1801, it was about 9 million. By 1901, it had risen to about 41 million. This was despite the fact that many people emigrated to North America and Australia to escape poverty. About 15 million people left Britain between 1815 and 1914. And from later on in the same article, In the early 19th century, Britain was ruled by an elite. Only a small minority of men were allowed to vote. The situation began to change in 1832 when the vote was given to more men. Constituencies were also redrawn and many industrial towns were represented for the first time. And then from later on, In 19th century Britain, at least 80% of the population was working class. In order to be considered middle class, you had to have at least one servant. Most servants were female. Throughout the 19th century, service was a major employer of women. In the 19th century, families were much larger than today. That was partly because infant mortality rate was so high. People had many children and accepted that not all of them would survive. End quote. As to be expected, with a massive influx of people moving into any metropolitan area, living conditions were absolutely terrible and waning quickly. The streets were dirty, the people rarely attained any primary education, children were slave labor, and adults worked under a system of essentially indentured servitude with no unions and scarcely any say in politics or community affairs. The aristocracy of Britain represented one of the greatest gaps in income inequality in human history. When people who are living in horrible you know, kind of living situations, see somebody with a life significantly better than they, it doesn't take long for them to want to act to change that situation, to try and move their life somewhat closer to the bar of being more tolerable. But upward mobility socially and economically was stagnant, as the aristocracy worked to ensure. And I will continue to allow Tom Lambert a few more lines to paint a picture for us. Quote, Living conditions in early 19th British century cities were often dreadful. However, there was one improvement. Gaslight was first used in 1807 in Pall Mall in London. Many cities introduced gas streetlights in the 1820s. However, early 19th century cities were dirty, unsanitary, and overcrowded. In them, streets were very often unpaved and were not cleaned. Rubbish was not collected, and it was allowed to accumulate in piles in the streets. Since most of it was organic, when it turned black and sticky, it was used as fertilizer. Continuing from a different part in the article. At the end of the 19th century, more than 25% of the population of Britain was living at or below subsistence level. Surveys indicate that around 10% were very poor and could not afford even basic necessities, such as enough nourishing food. Between 15 and 20% had just enough money to live on, provided they did not lose their job or have to take time off work through illness. If you had no income at all, you had to enter the workhouse. The workhouses were feared and hated by the poor. They were meant to be as unpleasant as possible to deter poor people from asking the state for help. However, during the 19th century, workhouses gradually became more humane. In the early 19th century, housing for the poor was often dreadful. Often they lived in back-to-backs. These were houses of three or sometimes only two rooms, one on top of the other. The houses were literally back to back. 
the back of one house joined onto the back of another, and they had only windows on one side. The bottom room was used as a living room come kitchen. The two rooms upstairs were used as bedrooms. The worst homes were cellar dwellings. These were one-room cellars. They were damp and poorly ventilated. The poorest people slept on piles of straw because they could not afford beds. End quote. Uh, these are all about the living situations and you know what metropolitan European societies looked like. You know, should we hop in a time machine and just go wandering the streets of London in 1830? What about the working conditions of the people? It's more terrible than you could actually imagine. Quote, During the 1800s, the factory system gradually replaced the system of people working in their own homes or in small workshops. In England, the textile industry was the first to be transformed. The Industrial Revolution also created a huge demand for female and child labor. Children had always done some work, but at least before the 19th century, they worked in their own homes, with their parents, or on land nearby. Children's work was largely seasonal, so they usually did have some time to play. When the children worked in textile factories, they often worked for more than 12 hours a day. In the early 19th century, Parliament passed laws to restrict child labor. However, they all proved to be unenforceable. Conditions in coal mines were often terrible. Children as young as five worked underground. However, in 1842, a law banned women and boys under 10 from working underground. End quote. So that paints a small picture of what home life was like, what work life might have been like, and now we get into the religious aspect of life in 19th century Europe. In Britain specifically, an 1851 survey found that only 40% of people attended church regularly. However, church attendance does not equate with belief in God or social proclivities to do so. The percentage of people believing in God, who may have been open to proselyting campaigns, was undoubtedly higher than the actual number of church attendees. So let's put a pin in European life in the 19th century, okay? We'll get back to that in just a minute. Let's contrast everyday American life from much of European life in large cities or even in semi-large townships. This is from Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Volume 1, starting on page 55. Quote, In America, the principle of the sovereignty of the people is neither barren nor concealed, as it is with some other nations. It is recognized by the customs and proclaimed by the laws. It spreads freely and arrives without impediment at its most remote consequences. If there is a country in the world where the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people can be fairly appreciated, where it can be studied in its application to the affairs of society, and where its dangers and its advantages may be judged, that country is assuredly America. The American Revolution broke out, and the doctrine of the sovereignty of the American people came out of the townships and took possession of the state. Every class was enlisted in its cause. Battles were fought and victories obtained for it. Sovereignty became the law of laws. Continuing from later on. At the present day, the principle of the sovereignty of the people has acquired in the United States all the practical development that the imagination can conceive. It is unencumbered by those fictions that are thrown over it in other countries, and it appears in every possible form, according to the exigency of the occasion. Sometimes the laws are made by the people in a body, as at Athens, and sometimes its representatives, chosen by universal suffrage, transact business in its name and under its immediate supervision. In some countries, a power exists which, though it is in a degree foreign to a social body, directs it and forces it to pursue a certain track. In others, the ruling force is divided, being partly within and partly without the ranks of the people. But nothing of the kind is to be seen in the United States. There, society governs itself for itself. All power centers in its bosom, and scarcely an individual is to be met with who would venture to conceive or still less to express the idea of seeking it elsewhere. The nation participates in the making of its laws by the choice of its legislators, and in the execution of them by the choice of the agents of the executive government. It may also be said to govern itself. So feeble and so restricted is the share left to the administration. So little do the authorities forget their popular origin and the power from which they emanate. The people reign in the American political world as the deity does in the universe. They are the cause and the aim of all things. Everything comes from them, and everything is absorbed in them. End quote. Now, of course, 
I I don't want to take issue with Tocqueville here, uh, but it, I honestly, his views of America were largely idealized and they were viewed largely through a legal lens. And he was kind of cleansed from seeing how the ideals laid out in the Constitution and the laws of America actually came into practice because he only spent uh, like six months or something in America. He was there for a very short time before he wrote Democracy in America. However, he does point out how powerful a concept sovereignty was and still is to the American dream. And he gets to some very fundamental pieces of humanity that we all share, spanning over, you know, 180 years since he wrote the book. The significant takeaway from his readings are that America stood out among their industrialized European counterparts as the freest society, where the aristocracy held the least power to affect change by comparison. He makes the case that all laws, all rules, everything was driven by the people for the people. However, the boots-on-the-ground impact of sovereignty being the primary central tenet of Americanism was the average citizen feeling empowered to be the master of their own destiny. People who were not subject to the dictates of the aristocratic elite who rule other countries. Literally nowhere else on the planet was upward mobility encouraged and possible like it was in 19th century America. So now let's connect these two floating dots. We talked about, you know, European life and now a little bit about American life. For the majority of people living in squalor in Europe, they were ruled by a disconnected class of a few elite families who had been in control of the constituent country's resources for centuries by that point. America posed a wonderful opportunity to the people who were living under the thumb of the European aristocracy. A land with fruited plains, unlimited business potential, where your voice will be heard through America's revolutionary governance system, where in the last century, more people had lifted themselves out of poverty than they had anywhere else on the planet for the past millennium. A land with millions of acres of unclaimed land, which had really just been claimed from the First Nationers in the last decade at this time. But well, well, that's a side note. America was a place where people who were unsatisfied with the government could merely expand the frontier further west and be, for all practical purposes, free from all government control. For what people in London were paying in rent, a person could own a home with 50 acres, some livestock, and a lovely white picket fence in America, not constrained to tiny back-to-back -back apartments with 20 people living in a house smaller than most American families inhabited. So along come these Yankees, bloody Brigham Young and Heber Creeper Kimball in 1840 Europe. They go door to door telling these Europeans how great life is in America and that they've found a history book of the ancient Israelites traveling to America, which was translated by a modern day prophet, seer and revelator. Not only is life great in America, but the Mormons have their own city right on the mother of rivers in the country. Nauvoo, the land of the beautiful, is located in the most advantageous spot on a peninsula overlooking the Mississippi a peninsula which will soon be crowned with a massive granite temple as a testament to American and Mormon wealth. Something worth noting, though, the whole grass is always greener sales pitch only works to those people who feel like their field is brown and barren. But for all those Europeans who are dissatisfied with their life in any way, some American missionaries showing up and offering a method for them to have a better life that wasn't really a hard sell. From Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History, we're beginning on page 264, we begin to see just how smart Bloody Brigham was in his sales efforts. Quote, The Mormon apostles who went to England had seen America's worst panic, the Panic of 1837, and thought they knew something about the poverty attendant upon economic depression. But in England, they found, in addition to financial chaos and unemployment, the appalling housing of the urban slums and a fearful burden of taxes weighing on the thin shoulders of the poor. Thousands of workers were crowded into squat tenements, built without water or sewers and almost without windows. Sporadic strikes were suppressed with vicious cruelty as the dread specter of revolution. George A. Smith wrote back to Nauvoo, quote, I have seen more beggars here in one day than I saw in all my life in America. Shocked by what they found, the Mormon elders began to preach the glory of America, along with the glory of the gospel. 
Brigham Young was convinced that immigration was the only solution for Europe's overpopulation, and made this the theme of many of his sermons. Soon, the missionaries were publishing in Liverpool a little journal called The Millennial Star, which frequently had the ring of a real estate agency propaganda pamphlet. Now quoting from The Millennial Star, quote, Living in America is about one-eighth of what it costs in this country. Millions on millions of acres of land lie before them unoccupied, with soil as rich as Eden, and a surface as smooth, clear, and ready for the plow as the park scenery of England. Instead of a lonely swamp or dense forest filled with savages, wild beasts, and serpents, large cities and villages are springing up in their midst, with schools, colleges, and temples, there being abundant room for more than a hundred millions of inhabitants." Now back to Brody. Before long, the apostles were converting Englishmen in thousands. Their success loosed a deluge of anti-Mormon pamphlets. Even the sophisticated London Athenium took note of the new sect. Quoting the Athenium, Mormonism is making rapid progress, it pointed out on April 3rd, 1841, particularly in the manufacturing districts, and it is also spreading in Wales. Furthermore, its converts are not made from the lowest ranks. Those sought and obtained by the Mormonite apostles are mechanics and tradesmen who have saved a little money, who are remarkable for their moral character, but who are exposed to the delusion from having, as Archbishop Sharp expressed it, studied the Bible with an ill-balanced mind. End quote. And that, that ends kind of all the quotes out of there. I, the, the takeaway that I'm, I'm putting forward here is Bloody Brigham was a brilliant businessman, okay? And I've said that numerous times before, but here we actually get to see a few examples of what set him apart from his counterparts in any leadership position in the church. Brigham Young was able to see the living conditions of the Europeans and realize it was something that many of them were unhappy with. He used the wide-fruited plains and the endless business opportunities of the American continent as the logic to back up the jesus -y heart cell, and it hit prospects with this bilateral approach to the point that they'd be insane to not take Brigham Young up on the offer. Brigham mastered Salesmanship 101. He showed these people a problem they didn't know they had, told them the solution to fix their problem, and then, to show his true genius... He followed up with a simple and practical pathway for them to fix what it was that was ailing them. The pathway to Mormon exaltation came in the form of the prototype for the Perpetual Immigration Fund. Now, some of you may be aware that Bloody Brigham created the Perpetual Immigration Fund back in 1849, which funded the immigration of somewhere around 30,000 Mormons from Europe to Utah. It was a tightly constructed and monitoring program that plugged new Mormons right into a simple algorithm which ended with them entering the Salt Lake Valley with just enough personal provisions to establish themselves and to contribute their extra property to the bishop's storehouse, but they had absolutely nothing more than that. This perpetual immigration fund that Brigham established in 1849 would later become a bargaining chip the federal government used against the Mormons in the 1880s when the government was trying to stamp out polygamy. What Bloody Brigham set up for the European immigrants in early 1841 was the alpha version of the Perpetual Immigration Fund. But even this 1841 iteration of the Immigration Fund wasn't Brigham's first run in moving hundreds or thousands of people from one place to another. If we remember back to the 1839 exodus of the Mormons from Missouri to Illinois and Iowa, Brigham and Heber Creeper were the main leaders in coordinating all the necessary logistics to move something like 10,000 Mormons hundreds of miles across the state lines. Brigham employed his skills acquired from a mere two years ago to build an immigration system to get thousands of Europeans to Nauvoo. So now we're back to Brody's No Man Knows My History. We're beginning on page 265. Quote, Few apostles remained in Britain more than a year, but before they left, their work in the hands of the lesser men, they had organized an immigration system which became so well known for its honesty and efficiency that it was cited in the House of Commons as a model for other companies to follow. The Mormons set up an office, chartered their own ships, organized the emigrants so that there would be ample food and water, and charged less than four pounds for the journey all the way to New Orleans. Much of the credit for the success of the immigration system was due to Brigham Young, whose business head was one of the soundest in the church. End quote. As a result of this system Bloody Brigham had constructed, thousands of European immigrants made their way to America in the following years. This is from a little bit earlier on the same page out of Brody's book. Quote, 
200 converts left England for Nauvoo in 1840. In 1841, the number jumped to 1,200, and the following year to 1,600. Now, quoting Parley P. Pratt, quote, They had rather be slaves in America than starve in this country, wrote Parley Pratt. I cannot keep them back. Back to Brody. By 1844, there were at least 8,000 more clamoring to leave, end quote. So let's jump over to Brigham's autobiography. This is taken from his journal entries in order to see his perspective of the famously successful missionary efforts as the Quorum was preparing to depart Europe to return to Nauvoo in April of 1841. You'll find a link to his manuscript history in the show notes should you care to read it for yourself. Prior to what we're about to read, in his history there are dozens of single-line entries listing the number of converts who were departing headed for New York or New Orleans. We're going to skip over those. They aren't terribly consequential. Just know that hundreds of people were making their way to America. So we pick up during their early April conference when they ran into an old friend who was headed for the Holy Land. Quote, April 5th, 1841, the Quorum of the Twelve met and resolved that the 17th of April be appointed for the apostles who are going to America to set sail from Liverpool. It was also resolved that the Twelve do business at the conference as a quorum, and call upon the church as a conference to sanction the same. Attended conference with elders Heber C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, Parley P. Pratt, and Orson Pratt, Wilford Woodruff, Willard Richards, John Taylor, and George A. Smith. There were represented 5,814 members, 136 elders, 303 priests, 169 teachers, and 68 deacons. Elder John Albiston was ordained to the office of patriarch. Ten high priests and twelve elders were also ordained. We had a good time. Down to April 7th. Attended council with the twelve. We blessed Elder O. Hyde, Orson Hyde, who was on his mission to Jerusalem. Now that is where Orson gets his nickname. His Nemo nickname, Orson Lachaidim, because he was on his way to his first mission to Jerusalem to ordain the Holy Land or anointed or something like that and and try and get actual, you know, Jewish converts. So they they, they kind of just coincided for this really brief time that Orson Hyde was, you know, he came across in early 1841, came across the pond, landed in Liverpool, and then hung out with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for a few days before the Quorum of the Twelve hopped on their ship to go back across the pond to America and Orson Lachaidem continued on his journey towards Jerusalem. So now we continue on to April 15th. Elders Orson Pratt, Willard Richards, George A. Smith, Levi Richards, and myself, having bid the saints in Manchester goodbye, went to Liverpool and arrived in time to attend a tea party at the music hall, where 200 saints were seated at table together. I addressed the meeting a short time and was followed by several of the 12. At the close of the party, the 12 met a few moments and agreed to sail on Tuesday. Now down to April 20th. 420, baby. 1841. Elders Heber C. Kimball, Orson Pratt, Wilford Woodruff, John Taylor, George A. Smith, Willard Richards, and family, myself, and a company of 130 saints went on board the ship Rochester with Captain Woodhouse at Liverpool, headed for New York. We gave the parting hand to Elders Orson Hyde and Parley P. Pratt, and a multitude of saints who stood upon the dock to see us start. We drew out into the River Mercy and cast anchor in sight of Liverpool, where we spent the day and night. It was with a heart full of thanksgiving and gratitude to God, my Heavenly Father, that I reflected upon his dealings with me and my brethren of the Twelve during the past year of my life, which was spent in England. It truly seemed a miracle to look upon the contrast between our landing and departing from Liverpool. We landed in the spring of 1841 as strangers in a strange land and penniless. But through the mercy of God, we have gained many friends, established churches in almost every noted town and city in the kingdom of Great Britain, baptized between seven and eight thousand, printed five thousand books of Mormon, three thousand hymn books, twenty-five hundred volumes of the Millennial Star, and fifty thousand tracts and emigrated to Zion 1,000 souls, established a permanent shipping agency, which will be a great blessing to the saints, and have left sown in the hearts of many thousands the seeds of eternal truth, which will bring forth fruit to the honor and glory of God. And yet we have lacked nothing to eat, drink, or wear. In all these things I acknowledge the hand of God. End quote. And just like that, 
The majority of the Quorum of the Twelve, minus Orson Lehydem and P-Cubed Parley P. Pratt, Parley Parker Pratt, had concluded their mission in England, and they set sail for the United States. And we'll pick up on their trip in the coming weeks as we continue to progress through the spring into the summer of 1841. We'll finish up today's historical portion talking about Brigham Young, but first, we have to talk about our newest nominee for a Nemo nickname. Somebody who's going to become very, very prominent as we continue in through Nauvoo years, and especially into the Utah years. Wilford Woodruff was born in March 1807 and lived a fairly standard early life working in his father's sawmill and flour mill. He joined the church on the last day of 1833 when the saints were actively admitted to being thrown out of Jackson County, Missouri. In 1835, Wilford Woodruff uh, left Kirtland for his first mission, which covered Arkansas and Tennessee, which happened after he'd been a member of the Zion's Camp Expedition back in 1834. He was called to be an apostle in 1839 and eventually became a member of the Anointed Quorum and served as a chaplain for the Nauvoo Legion. Now, that's getting into, uh, you know, kind of later Nauvoo territory, so we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But I will just add that Wilford Woodruff was one of the foremost apocalyptists in the presidency. He really took after his forefather, Joseph Smith, in that regard, chronicling natural disasters and preaching frequently that the end is nigh at hand. But I'm sure if you nailed him down, if you nailed Wilford Woodruff down and asked point blank, hey, you're a prophet of God, when is the Lord coming to rule the earth and redeem Israel? He'd probably answer with some vanilla line with like, Oh, whenever it is in the Lord's will to return, we must have our lamps filled with oil in preparation. Now, of course, in view of an ever-expanding timeline of the apocalypse as it comes with all apocalyptic ministers, how about something like, whenever, Wilford? Just whenever. Yeah, Wilford, whenever. Yeah. No, that one's really lame. All right. Wilford Woodruff also provides one of the best contemporary accounts of Mormon history with his incessant journal keeping. Woodruff's journals have been cited thousands of times by hundreds of historians. He eventually became church historian and served in that capacity until he was called to be fourth president of the church in 1889. These journals have nearly daily entries since his baptism back in 1833. And if not for his journals, we wouldn't have any record of many of the prominent speeches that were given by church leaders. Wilford Woodruff spent nearly every waking moment of his life writing probably had like a little ink smudge on his nose all the time that nobody bothered to tell him about how about ink and quill will i like that one that's actually a pretty good one uh how about we get a few quotes from the man maybe that'll engender a couple of good name nicknames here here's a good one quote if we're going to do away with polygamy it would be only one feather in the bird one ordinance in the church and kingdom do away with that, then we must do away with the prophets and apostles, with revelation in the gifts and graces of the gospel, and finally give up our religion altogether. End quote. Yeah, Wilford Woodruff really liked his polygamy, didn't want to outlaw it, but he died in hiding after he did away with polygamy <laughs> because Wilford Woodruff signed the 1890 Manifesto. And you know that he was, it wasn't really that well kept in hiding. You know, he'd been in there for a few years by the time he died. And the obituaries are quite fascinating to read about Wilford, Wilford Woodruff because eh, they were pointing out that he was in hiding from the government. So he was, he probably was a little dirty, you know, long hair. How about we go with, uh, you know, for, for this name of Wilford Woodruff, how about Scruffy Druffy? That fits the bill, you know, right up to his death. He was scruffy. Look up any pictures of him. He's, he's kind of, yeah. yeah, well, he's got a rat's nest on his chin. Anyway, here's another quote that, that might create a good nickname for us. He said, quote, I say to Israel, the Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. It is not in the program. It is not in the mind of God. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place. And so he will with any other man who attempts to lead the children of men astray from the oracles of God and from their duty. End quote. I mean, yeah, he can't lead the church astray. And this is a quote that's touted often by, you know, Mormons and ex-Mormons alike who talk about the infallibility of the prophets, that God will remove them from the earth before they lead the people astray. 
Um, but almost every church leader of Wilford Woodruff's time thought that he had led them astray when he took polygamy off the table with the 1890 Manifesto. He was wayward Wilford to them. And he could be to us. I like that one. Wayward Wilford. All right. All right. Okay. Those are just a few of them. If you'd like to join in on the fun and play along with our Nemo nickname game here, you can chime in with the hashtag Nemo nickname on Twitter or on uh, Facebook or Patreon or any other social media on which our presence coincides, or you can write into nakedmormonism at gmail.com. What do you think? Whenever Wilford or Ink and Quill Will, Scruffy Druffy or Wayward Wilford or, you know, we can vote on those, or maybe you can be like Azalem Ali. You know, he came up with the uh, sidekick of Biff for Hiram Smith here. You know, maybe uh, you'll come up with something way better than I did, and I'll be happy to arbitrarily select next week's winner and plug them. And uh, I hope to see you on the social medias. So let's go ahead and uh, tie a bow on the history for tonight by getting back to the central focus of today's deep dive. That is Brigham Young. Okay. Bloody Brigham was nothing if not a cold and calculating businessman. He understood economics at a small level, and he was able to scale those concepts up to fabricate massive programs to move thousands of people thousands of miles in a single organized fashion. A lot more can be said of Brigham Young and his legacy. But the resounding fact remains, he saved the church multiple times when it was somehow in dire straits. Brigham Young strikes me as the guy that Joe could go to and say, Brother Brigham, I have a problem. Will you take care of it? And Brigham would simply answer, Consider it done, Brother Joseph. And it would be done. You know, every major business needs a Brigham to survive. You know, Joe was the ideas guy. He was the wacky CEO who was constantly surrounded by people that were smarter than him who would translate his crazy musings on how things should be into tangible actions. And every CEO needs that assistant who they can give the most obscure and complex task who will subsequently complete said task without asking any questions or needing clarification. Keeping the Lion of the Lord in his position on the very edge of the spotlight is only an effective strategy for as long as he's kept loyal and not incentivized to move up in the corporation anytime soon. But with his brilliance and his ability to get done whatever he sets his mind to, Bloody Brigham doesn't strike me like the kind of guy who enjoys middle management forever. I'm Ryan McKnight, and welcome to the Mormon Leaks Minute. So many answers and assurances can come through daily searching and studying the scriptures, and with sincere and pleading prayer... But there are no such promises on the internet. You heard the intro. It is time once again for the Mormon Leaks Minute. And we are graced by the presence of the entire Mormon Leaks team, Ryan and Ethan. Gentlemen, welcome. Because there's so many of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bryce. Yeah, you know, it is funny that uh, people who aren't familiar with our organization or especially like uh, active Mormons, that they think that there's like this whole big team scheming behind the scenes at Mormon Leaks to try to like take down the Mormon church. They they're surprised to find out that it's just two two guys that have regular jobs and do this on the side. And have only seen Straight each other David with a slingshot. <laughs> once. We've only seen each other once in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully uh we're going to be mitigating that problem in uh throughout Ju uh all of twenty eighteen, right? Uh you guys have yeah. a couple of conferences planned and we're uh kind of discussing the details of that as we go forward, right? We're hoping. So. Yeah, I mean, we have. Yeah, we're hoping so. I mean, we'll be at Sunstone for sure, and um, and we'll be at you know individually. We'll probably be at a couple of the ind uh, regional Sunstones, and then we're you know we're looking at some other non-Mormon um, conferences. We haven't officially lined any of them up yet, but we're hoping to attend some some other conferences that uh, sort of on behalf of, of Faith Leaks and that project. Very cool. Uh, would you like to just very quickly talk to us about how Faith Leaks has now developed since the launch? Well, I, I guess since the last time we spoke, we've we've had our first uh, leak under the Faith Leaks umbrella, um, and it was a, a Jehovah's Witness related leak uh, about some uh, sexual abuse and how the church handled it. It was a series of thirty three documents that uh, 
you know, they're quite fascinating to read. I encourage people to check it out at faithleads.org and go to the newsroom for the links. Um, it got a lot of media attention like we expected it to. Um, Gizmodo wrote the original article on it and then it was picked up by some, some large and small publications. Slate, uh, republished it. Uh, mm. uh there was uh, a lot of international coverage on this one. Yeah, probably about and a dozen different ha- languages. Yeah, wow. we, we, we were getting links sent to us and, uh, Arabic and, um, I, I actually gave an, an actual interview for a, a newspaper in Spain. Um, mo- most of these uh, articles, they didn't actually interview us. I think the only interviews I actually gave were uh, Ethan and I both spoke to Gizmodo, and then I spoke to the Spanish newspaper. All of the other publications, they were just sort of re-reporting uh, the Gizmodo article. And um, But yeah, we got a ton of messages from... Ex Jehovah's Witness thanking us. Uh, we we were on a podcast together. What was the name of that podcast, Ethan? Uh, Watchtower in Focus. Okay, Ooh. so I, okay, that wasn't JW Survey. It wasn't called JW Survey. That's the name of their site. Yeah, jwsurvey.org. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if people want to check that out. They're like out of uh, England, out of the UK, and we were. It was kind of a panel discussion that we were part of there. Um, and cool. it was good. Good. It was yeah. So. It was my first non Mormon podcast. <laughs> I think for me too. I think so. Uh, what was? What, do you guys have a take or any commentary that you want to add to the information that was leaked? Or because uh, I, I I do have a little bit that I kind of want to uh, mention about it that that yeah. seems to be kind of relevant. But I kind of want to get your guys' take first. Well, as far as the actual case goes and, and what the guy, what the perpetrator is accused of doing, it kind of speaks for himself. It's, you know, pretty heinous acts that he's being accused of. I thought the most interesting thing about the leak and, and I think what most people found valuable in it was to be able to peek behind the scenes, just like a lot of our Mormon leaks and just to see, you know, what the process is behind closed doors and, and how it is they handle it and handle these types of situations. And what was very clear, um, and for anybody that reads it, this becomes very clear early on when you're reading the documents. Um, these leaders, these guys that are leading the, the Jehovah's Witness Church from, you know, from low leadership to high leadership, they're trying to be, you know, uh, jur- jur- investigator, jury, judge, prosecution, uh, executioner. They're trying to wear uh, you know, therapists, they're trying to wear all of the hats and they don't do any of them well. And, and so it's just a debacle really. And it just highlights how, how incompetent and how unqualified these people are to handle these very serious situations. And if anything, I hope that, um, you know, people that are involved in the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, I don't think these documents are going to cause them to question their faith. And I don't necessarily think they're designed for that. But I hope that they can at least say, hey, maybe we need to reevaluate, you know, how we're handling situations where there's accusations of sexual abuse. That, that's my take. I don't know if Ethan would have a, a different take on that or not. But No, definitely. I mean, if the if uh, if Watchtower can take a look at this and be like, yeah, we need to improve how we handle this sort of thing, then that's a win for Faith Leaks. Yeah. I do find a fascinating point that we can draw these similarities between Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormon Church. And um, obviously, it's always seen by, you know, public commentary that the Catholic Church is the greatest offender of covering up sex abuse in within the church. And we see this kind of replete throughout most major world religions that they try and when something happens that they try and play all of the roles, like you said, Ryan, it's just, yeah. Yeah, they, they try and handle the issue internally. And by and large, none of the people that are actually at any level in this process are mandatory reporters that have to, you know, legally speaking, they have to report this. So I just find it uh, rather unfortunate and um, frustrating to see a common theme between these, these similar leaks. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of similarities. Um, although I must admit that I, I, I often, lately, as I've learned more and more about the Jehovah's Witness, I find, I find myself readily saying that they have it much worse than we do. Definitely. Oh my Some of the stories that I've heard. It's about the control that they have over their members. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. If I had a choice of being raised Mormon and being raised Jehovah's Witness, I'd choose Mormon any day. Yeah. Any day. 
Yeah. And I'm sure that varies greatly depending on where and in what culture and in, you know, what, what geographic and demographic area you grow up in either of those religions. But yeah, they definitely share a lot of uh, similar cult tendencies that we can, you know, uh, attribute to being part of the, uh, the, the cult mentality. So yeah, yeah, uh, fascinating the underlying themes. So, um, so let's get to it, guys. Um, you guys released, a bunch of documents that are concerning temple administration, as well as a uh, employee pay scale from mm-hmm. 2008, and that's for the non-tax uh, exempt, the for-profit side of the church. No, no. The well, let me clarify something there. When it says non, okay. when it says what, what does it say? Exempt or not exempt? It says non-exempt, right? Non-exempt. What yeah. What it's referring to, it means that those are hourly employees. They are, oh, okay. They are not exempt. From overtime is what it means. An over an exempt employee would be a salaried employee who does not earn overtime. That's probably some uh, some business jargon that I just did not understand, did not yes. pick up on. Okay, so that's yes. that's an uh, important clarification. And I'd also I'd also like to point out that we have released uh, in the past several other uh, scales pay scales that look exactly like that one, and they're from different years. So the the good thing about this one is it's just another year we can add to sort of the you know it's another pu- a puzzle piece. If people go to the wiki page for this most recent pay scale and they look at the bottom under the C also, it it will take them to a landing page where they'll be able to find the other ones as well. I think that's extremely useful and um I'm reminded of something that I you know, recently read out of the CES letter and it's uh, – it was talking about the dishonesty that is exhibited by the prophets and what it was referring to is uh, when Gordon B. Hinckley was being interviewed uh, back in the early 2000s, I believe it was, by uh, some major media outlet, BBC, I, I tend to forget. But they asked about the availability of church records. Uh, and it was a, uh, I'm sorry, it was a German interviewer. And the interviewer said that in our country, we have to, you know, churches have to publish all of the information. Why is that not the case for the Mormon church? And, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley said very dishonestly that anyone, uh, we think that that's sensitive information that only people who have paid tithing should be able to see. And, uh, it was obviously, he was trying to deflect the, the question because he didn't have a good answer to it. But even that is incredibly dishonest because, the average tithe payer can't see the pay scale of church employees. They can't see any of the church's financial records. So I think adding one more, you know, year of pay scale like this just adds to the transparency that the church is refusing to embrace. Yeah, and let's be a little more accurate. No church member, and not the not to it would be incorrect to say the average church member can't see it. No church yeah, member unless right. they're unless they are directly working with that information as part of their employment. Um, which would be very few people. Uh, yeah, they cannot see these things. So, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose maybe we're, you know, maybe the apologist can say that, uh, uh, Hinckley was actually prophesying and we're actually fulfilling that prophecy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Finally, some transparency, even though it's like post hoc, it's after, yeah. you know, an accurate re- yeah. revelation was given. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so by and large, though, um, aside from this this pay scale that you guys leaked, it's these yeah. internal temple documents. Sure. Uh, did any of these stand out, or do we want to just kind of talk about them all? You know, kind of in a cumulative, abstract kind of analysis. I mean, we could probably do a little bit of both. I I, I found this leak, and, and and you know, Ethan may have a different take. I don't know, but look. A lot of our leaks, you know, people will come in, they'll, they'll, they'll criticize them for not being scandalous. And, and, and we always kind of respond with the same thing that, that there's no intention really to be scandalous. I mean, if there happens to be a scandalous leak, then there happens to be one. But really, we're just putting, you know, puzzle pieces together. And that's what these leaks are. They, they're, they're mildly interesting at best. Um, but really what they do is they, they, they disclose some information that I think is, you know, worthy for the public of knowing about, you know, like some of them discussed the cost of this, uh, uh, I guess some work they were doing out outside in the landscaping or whatever it was. Yeah. $30,000 to prune a tree apparently. Right. And I guess, you know, the temple <laughs> recorder was being asked to justify it. And it sounds like it originated maybe under the previous recorder's watch or whatever. I, I'm not really even sure, but 
really what what these documents to me show is is just it just reinforces this idea that I've been I've been saying this since I was at Sunstone last year and that is um church members will have you believe that the LDS church is a religion dabbling in business and and I my contention is is that it's a business that's dabbling in religion and mm-hmm. I think that that these documents merely reinforce that and that doesn't mean the church is not true it doesn't mean that you shouldn't give tithing. It doesn't mean that you, sh- you know, you should lose your testimony. But it, but it does mean that we should, rec- you know, call a spade a spade. And, and I think these documents, you know, lend itself to that. That really, the the temple is a profit center. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a revenue center. It's viewed as such, and um, and it's treated as such. So yeah, that, that's my take. Ethan, you want to add to that? Uh, I would ju- I would totally agree. Um, one thing that I'd like to say we're we're often accused of just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, but we release anything that is verifiable that has to do with the church, right? Um, and the and the, these documents are a good example, right? As Ryan said, they're not necessarily scandalous, and people get upset when we don't publish scandalous things. We've never claimed that we're going to publish anything scandalous, but these are documents that do show where finances are being spent. And we believe that the public has, uh, at least tithe payers have a right to know exactly where money is being spent. Um, so uh, other than that, I completely agree with what Ryan said. Um, I, and I, uh, I'll just second, I guess I'll third all of what you guys said and, uh, just reiterate that the entire goal behind Mormon leaks is a commitment to transparency and, it's a thing that your guys' organization wouldn't exist if there wasn't a need for it. And obviously, yeah. even these, these, you know, perceived as mundane leaks paint a more holistic picture of the church. And it, you know, each one of these pops another hole in the veil that we can kind of peer through and see to the other side that I think is very, very useful. Even if there isn't anything particularly salacious to discuss in any of these things. Just showing yeah. that it is, um, kind of like Ryan said, it is an organization. It's a, a corporation that happens to dabble in religion and it should be viewed as such. I think that's a, a solid takeaway. A lot of our leaks, you know, I actually think you could make an argument that all of our leaks, maybe with the exception of one or two, but pretty much all of our leaks, um, can easily be viewed from a faithful perspective. And this one is no exception. And in fact, if I was a believing member and I saw this leak, um, you know, I suppose, you know, the amount of money they spent on this, uh, you know, outdoors work or whatever it was could, could be debated. But if you set that aside for a second, you know, it's actually a refreshing, I suppose, to see that, you know, they're not just spending money willy nilly all the time that here some money was spent that, you know, maybe was not properly documented or something. And the temple recorder is being required to provide a justification. So, um, you know, that's actually a good thing. Now, the, now the one problem is, is we don't know, uh, you know, the aftermath of it or what would happen, let's say, if, if it was determined that, you know, money was unnecessarily spent on this situation, you know, what mm-hmm. kind of, uh, internal controls do they put in place or policies to, to prevent it from happening in the future? You know, those are things that it would be nice to know. But, um, you know, at least we know that they're, you know, they're partially doing things right. And if they did, um, change things, you know, going forward to prevent these things from happening, then, then, you know, they would have done some good things. So in that sense, I mean, you can look at this leak and say, Hey, look, they're, they're actually, you know, trying not to just, you know, write blank checks for everything. If that makes yeah, sense. and I, I suppose that's commendable, but I also see that, you know, there are dollar amounts attached to a couple of these line items in here. Yeah. And I just go back to the $17,000 rug example all the time. Yeah. It's like, you know, that can buy a lot of meals for homeless people. It's kind of frustrating to see it. Well, and, and, and we think that those, you know, arguments also should be made. I, and I, I would just reiterate that, uh, you know, as an organization, Mormon Leaks, you know, we don't really care if uh, if the debate is that or if the debate is you know how do they you know the faithful perspective debate um you know both both discussions are valid and should both should happen um and we just want it to happen period right so it can't have neither conversation can happen without the information being made available so 
So let's go ahead and jump off to the third uh, reason we're talking today. And this was a piece that hopefully Ethan is going to kind of take over the conversation on. Ethan, you wrote an op-ed piece that the Salt Lake Tribune published. You want to tell us about it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I think I would imagine that most of your listeners know that Thomas Monson passed away recently. The New York Times did an obituary on him that I thought personally was completely fair. Um, yes, it highlighted some controversial topics and, and things that happened while he was president of the church, but it also highlighted some good things that also happened in the church. Um, I thought it was entirely fair. Apparently, some Mormons, apparently about 200,000 Mormons did not think so because they all signed a, yeah. they all signed a petition and about – they had about 120,000 signatures in less than 24 hours demanding that the New York Times rewrite uh, their obituary for Thomas Monson. And I just thought that was absolutely ridiculous, first off. But what really, yeah. really got under my skin was that Sam Young's uh, protect, the, protect LDS Children petition that has been going for – since Halloween. He, he launched it Halloween yep. night, right? So uh, uh, two and a half months now. And it barely has over 11,000 signatures. Yeah. Uh, give a little bit of background. What is uh, Sam Young doing? Because as we're recording this – just I believe it was today or yesterday, he had this large press conference that just happened. And uh, of course, I'm going to have to talk about that more on the show. But uh, Ethan, do you mind telling us a little bit more about Sam Young and his movement? Yeah. So Sam Young, um, in in my opinion, is doing one of the most important movements uh, in, within Mormon activism for a while. And uh, he is trying to get the church um, to stop asking sexually explicit questions specifically to children. Um, in the bishop uh, interviews and the worthiness interviews, right? And he he started a petition. He now has a website where people can go and share their stories, their negative experiences. Um, and there have been some very, very scary stories that have been shared. Um, Mormon stories yeah. uh, uh, early on in the movement did did a few shows uh, with people that were asked extremely explicit questions um, and the side effects that it has. Uh, um, I mean, it grooms, it grooms these kids to not recognize abusive situations. And it also leads yep. to self-loathing, depression, suicide. It, it's terrible. Yeah. And, and uh, just generally speaking, a, a completely warped sense of what is considered acceptable and not when it comes to human sexuality. And, you know, when, when you're talking explicit questions, it's extremely explicit in some cases. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, you have um, a 14 or 15 year old girl who was, you know, in a room alone with a 40 year old bishop who is not a mandatory reporter, who has no training and counseling, who is not, you know, who, who is not in any sort of legitimate place to be asking questions, anything like this. And they should not be asked in the <laughs> to begin with and it's just seen as the norm and it's been something that's been the norm well probably since the beginning of the church essentially and i i thoroughly commend sam young and his efforts with protect lds children and that's protect lds children.org is his website where you can sign the petition and everything um but i do um i side with you ethan it's extremely frustrating that his petition to try and stop sexual abuse in the church has 11,000 signatures where the New York Times wrote something that was seen as a little bit scathing about the prophet of the church. They, uh, they're able to pull in 20 times that. Yeah. What kind of a world do we live in? What is this? Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of what I conclude with. If I can't, if I may, I'd like to read the concluding paragraph in my op ed. I say, um, please do. This is 21st century Mormonism. Reporting the public events of a public figure's life is unacceptable while allowing an untrained middle-aged man to take 13-year-old girls behind closed doors and ask if they masturbate is completely acceptable. This is plainly absurd. And it, it, that's, the, that's the, exactly the idea that I wanted to portray in the op-ed. I, I, I by no means think that um, – uh, and Sam Sam even says that this is not meant to disparage the church. He's not trying to take the church down. He's just trying to protect children, right? And it's frustrating that that active members of the church don't realize that. They're seeing this as a criticism against the leaders of the church. And, of course, it is so taboo to criticize the Mormon leaders. And that is exactly – well, in my opinion, um, I'm sure there's many reasons why. But in my opinion, that is the dominating reason why his signature only has – why his petition only has 11,000 signatures. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, anything to add into this conversation, Ryan? Well, I mean, obviously, I, I agree with everything that Ethan said, and I thought he did a really good job on the op-ed. While it, it's definitely important to highlight these egregious situations, you know, where, you know, they're they're asking these questions about masturbation, whether they be to young men or young women, all that kind of stuff. I I hope people realize that it just doesn't, you know, stop there. It's not just, in my opinion, it's not just about these extreme cases. To me... Um, the entire subject of sex, no matter how graphic or how benign it may be, should be off limits. And, and an example that I've, I've discussed with some people, like, let's say, let's say that, that for example, that a, a young woman is going to come into the bishop and let's say she does this completely on her own without the, the prodding of the bishop. She comes in and let's say, you know, she's 16 years old and let's say she comes in and she's, she confesses to having had sex with uh, her boyfriend because she feels guilty about it. Now, if the bishop, let's say, agrees with the uh, top-level argument that Sam Young is making that, you know, that the uh, that the conversation should be respectful and not, uh, you know, not explicit, all that kind of stuff, he may still proceed and, and talk about how you know, she needs to seek forgiveness and, and, you know, he, he might do all that without asking about the explicit nature of the sexual encounter, right? And, and for me, I think we need to remind ourselves that even that is not okay, in my opinion. And to me, mm-hmm. what, what I think should happen is, and I hope the church takes a serious look at this. If this 16 year old girl comes in and confesses to this, uh, uh, sin that she feels that she's committed, the bishop should immediately stop her and say, if you need to talk to somebody about this, here's a list of professionals that I can send you to. Um, go speak to your young women's leader, uh, you know, if you can't talk to your parents. But the conversation with the bishop should essentially end at that point. Well, and I, this is kind of a case-by-case basis, and it's really kind of – this is where it's kind of – challenging to analyze the utility of these conversations, right? Because if you have somebody who has gone through something, bishops are there to be an emotional support for their community. And if you have a good ward and a good bishop, you know, a a kid going and saying, hey, I had something happen to me that I don't understand, or, you know, I, I need to talk to somebody who aren't my parents about this. Talking to a bishop can be a good first step for a person to try and analyze, you know, what happened. And, Jumping off from that, going and seeking professional help is a great idea. That should always be the the first place to go unless you have uh, – well, a bishop should just be a backup and emotional support only. What happens – but but what happens currently with these interviews is the bishops are oftentimes causing more damage psychologically speaking when they're asking these sexually explicit questions and degrading uh, sex and degrading, you know, these these emotional feelings that are associated with sexual pleasure. And that's, you know, causing more damage than it's than it's possibly healing than any level yeah. of emotional support that the bishop could offer does not outweigh the damage that's caused. Well, and, but here's here's here's, you know, one problem with with what you're saying. And I don't think you're discounting this problem, but I want to make sure it doesn't get lost in the conversation. In theory, what you're saying is true, right? You know, a bishop is supposed to be there to offer, you know, positive support and all this stuff. Yeah. But let's not forget that bishops are untrained for that. Exactly. They're not even, they're not even close to being trained for that. And so, you know, in another, in, in another denomination where maybe the pastor is a trained therapist or they're trained to deal with, the, they're professionally trained to handle these situations, you might be able to say, okay, we can trust this guy um, to a certain extent to be able to provide some meaningful um, support in these situations. But in the case mm-hmm. of the Mormon church, because there's literally no training and what you have is, you know, you have some accountant or some dentist or, you know, whatever, fill in the blank as a bishop. I really think that it, they're, uh, if they want to, you know, be a shoulder to cry on for, a person who's over 18, you know, fine, whatever. But when we're talking about minors, I think that, you know, the conversation has to be cut off as soon as possible and professional resources offered. And, and, and I would be even okay if those things get offered without telling the parents. I mean, if that's what needs to be done because yeah. of the seriousness of it. But beyond making a judgment call to not inform the parents, 
beyond that, I just don't think the ju- the the bishop should be making any kind of decisions. Yeah, I can thoroughly agree. And it, yeah, exactly the way that the the interviews are structured now, they do not foster a feeling of supporting adult that are like a counseling adult that these children can feel like they confide in. I don't know about you guys, but when I was in the church, I always dreaded the bishop's interview, right? Oh, no, now I have to go in and lie to the bishop about what I do because I'm a 14-year-old boy, right? <laughs> so, I, I mean, the, the, what gets lost is the fact that we're – the the mechanism that is created is supposed to help people, but it is causing damage. That is the main problem. And there I don't think that there is a a constructive way to, you know, rebuild this system from what it is or to change a policy, a single policy that will stop the damage from happening. It's just the entire structure in and itself is flawed from its foundation. And uh I don't think there's any easy answer to that, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I I I agree with what you guys said. I, I'd like to add that me personally, in a perfect world, I would like to see the question, do you keep the law of chastity completely out of these interviews yeah. at all? Agreed. I, that, that yep. the, even asking something so subtle as that has groomed most active Mormons to not realize that that is abusive in and of itself. Absolutely. Right. And especially because like, do we really know what the law of chastity fully entails? Like, could anybody really authoritatively say, for example, that masturbation is against the law of chastity? I don't really think we can say that. So when, when a bishop asks, some bishops might be referring to masturbation, some might not. And so and, unless the church is like, you know, willing to put their foot down one way or the other on that, I mean, we shouldn't even be asking that question because depending on your definition – None of the young men are following the law of chastity. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, it's not an easy problem. And um, I I am glad that Sam Young is doing what he is doing because we cannot let the church reform itself in this without any outside actors or outside watchdogs or anything. And, yeah. and Sam Young becoming the go-to activist to try and – cause some kind of reform or even just to shed, you know, the, the harsh white light of, you know, public scrutiny on this being a problem. I think that's, uh, you know, obviously a commendable effort. Um, I would like to say real quick before we close out this conversation on this chapter of it, at least, um, I, I want people to know if they don't already know this, that Sam Young is an amazing man. I've, I've met him twice in person. I've had dinner with him twice I've had extensive private conversations with him. This is, this is genuinely one of the best human beings I've ever met in my life. And I don't say that lightly. Um, and he, his, and that is one of the reasons why his voice is so powerful on this subject because he's not playing a, a character here. This is not a game. This is not an attention grab. And in fact, he has waffled at several uh, various points in this process because of how much attention things were getting in it and, and it was causing him some anxiety. This mm-hmm. is coming from his heart and it is sincere. And I think it comes across, uh, like that to anybody who, who sits down and listens to him. I just wanted to throw that out and, and give him a real strong plug. Absolutely. And, uh, of course, if people are interested, they can chase the show notes to find the, uh, Salt Lake Tribune op-ed piece. Uh, all of the leaks that we kind of discru- discussed in broad strokes, as well as protectleschildren.org. You can find everything in the show notes. Uh, anything that you guys want to uh, toss in before we call it a night? Just a uh, thank you for the continuing support from you, Bryce, and and from your listeners and everybody who uh, follows Mormon Leaks and and has been s- and, and and now Faith Leaks. And you know we appreciate your past support and your continued support, and, and hopefully we'll have your support for many many more years to come. Ditto. Absolutely, Ethan. Just echo exactly what Ryan just said. Thank you so much. It's always it's always a lot of fun having these conversations with you, and uh, they're very much needed. So, um, yeah, thanks for the support. Absolutely, and uh, thank you guys for what you do and for coming on and for joining us tonight, and we will be talking in the future. All right, see thanks. you later, Bryce.
All right, that will do it for our Mormon Leaks Minute. Once again, thank you so much to Ryan and to Ethan for coming on and and sharing so much with us. You'll find links to everything that we discussed in the show notes for today's episode. And that's pretty much going to do it for today. We have a couple of uh, little house cleaning items to take care of really quick. Uh, Just to let everybody know, we recently brought on Natalie. She is known as the Science Mom to help out with a bit of podcast coordinating. See, I am terrible when it comes to logistics and planning and stuff like that. I spend most of my time reading and writing, so I'm really terrible when it comes to social media. And any of you who follow the Facebook page know that I am really not that active on social media and whatnot, and especially on Twitter. So we're bringing on Natalie to really kind of help us out with coordinating logistics of getting people as guests on the show and getting me as guests on their show and whatnot. With that said... If there are any people out there that you see in any community, whether it's the atheist and skeptic or science community, whether it's the history, whether it's a religion community, whatever uh, podcasting or broadcasting community of any sort that you see that you think would be a good fit for this show that you know might provide a good interview or something to that effect – It'd be really cool if you got in touch with us. We'd really like to, to, you know, try and explore those avenues of, of expanding and bringing in new people onto the show. So if you have any recommendations for people that we should bring on the show or a show that I should go on to, you can shoot off an email to ncnewell, that's n-c-n-e-w-e-l-l at gmail.com. That's how you get in touch with Natalie. Or you can send it over to me at nakedmormonism at gmail.com, and we'll see if we can chase some of those down. Uh, we have a few people in line that we've already kind of lined up that Natalie has helped coordinate, which thank you so much, Natalie. I'm looking forward to working with you. And we have a couple of other people that we would like to get nailed down, but I know there are a lot of other people out there that I'm woefully unaware of that might provide a really good interview. So if somebody comes to mind and thinking about that, you know, get in touch with us on social media or through either one of those emails. That's ncnewell at gmail.com or nakedmormonism at gmail.com. In addition to that, if you do enjoy this show, please consider giving it a like on iTunes and Stitcher or, you know, any of your podcasting app of choice. I haven't plugged this for a really long time, and it shows in the reviews that we haven't had any uh, new reviews for quite some time. So if you're enjoying what you're listening to or have any uh, recommendations, send any recommendations over email. But, uh, you know, pop on over to your podcasting app of choice. Pop on a five-star review. That would really help with visibility of the show. And uh, for all of those who have rated uh, recently or throughout the three years of the history of this show, thank you so much for doing that. It's because of you that we have as much visibility as we do. Thank you, thank you. With that, we also have a new patron to thank who is supporting the show over at patreon.com slash naked mormonism. And that is David. I try and keep the last names out of these. So thank you so much, David, for uh, for pledging to support the show. And I hope you enjoy all of the extra content that you get with all of the uh, the Nemo Home Evenings, with all of the extra episodes, with the document readings, with the uh, the hangouts, with everything. Uh, I really hope you enjoy all of that extra content over there. And thank you so much once again for pledging to support. So let's go ahead and uh, shut it down for the evening. I need to thank Julie for running the Twitter and Facebook pages. She is the only reason that anything ever gets posted up on the uh, the Twitter and Facebook pages. So thank you so much for that, Julie. Be sure to give her a follow at the real Emma Hale. Thank you so much to Jason Camo. He's provided the music that's used in the show with his permission. You can find his music at a lost Thank you to Andrew Torres of the law offices of P. Andrew Torres and the opening arguments podcast for providing a legal counsel for this show. Thank you so much once again to all the patrons who support the show. And most importantly, thank you to those most important listeners out there once again for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
the racist puppet dog. The preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.